For 1400 years, British people have been fishing cod off the coast of Iceland. This was never liked by the people of Iceland, as the British sailors generally had larger ships and bigger catches, and drained the waters of cod, which was one of the main sources of food and wealth in Iceland. Several disputes arose before the 20th century, but the British always seemed to triumph over the Danish, who owned Iceland at that time. In 1901, Iceland was said to only have control over 6 kilometers of water around itself, meaning British sailors could pretty much come right up to Iceland to fish. In 1944, Iceland got its full independence from Denmark, and one of its first orders of business was to deal with the British stealing all their cod. In 1951, Iceland just decided, you know, by itself to expand its control of waters to 7 kilometers from 6. This was basically nothing, but Britain was insulted and banned all Icelandic fish from their ports. Now, Britain was the main trading partner of Iceland, and if they didn't buy Icelandic fish, then Iceland could go bankrupt. So this is basically what happened. Iceland extended its sea borders by 1 kilometer. Britain got so angry they stopped buying cod. The USSR, who wanted a friend in the North Atlantic, started buying cod. The US, seeing the USSR influencing Iceland, began buying cod too, and encouraged other NATO members to do the same. This all happened in about the span of five years, from 1951 to 1956. Iceland saw that they could get away with this kind of thing, and in 1958, Asgir Asgirsson, uh, president of Iceland, announced that Iceland would extend its sea borders from 7 kilometers to 22 kilometers. This time, everybody was against Iceland. They pretty much just unilaterally decided they were going to extend their sea borders. The sea zone this time covered areas frequently fished by many British fishermen, and the British had to stop the Icelandic bill. So they sent up an entire fleet commanded by Commodore B.J. Anderson. Britain had sent about 20 warships, mostly destroyers, and frigates, and they had many fishing trawlers in the area. Iceland had basically two ships, the ICGV Thor and another tiny trawler, as well as a few smaller ships. On September 4th, ICGV Aegir, the older version, attempted to stop a trawler as it was in its proclaimed 22 km radius. But the HMS Russell showed up and scared it away. The main engagement of the first COD war came on the 12th of November, when ICGV Thor tried to stop a British trawler. The trawler fled, and Thor shot at it, missed, and then the HMS Russell showed up and began a pursuit. When more British ships arrived, the Thor peeled off and fled. Iceland had lost, but they didn't. Over the next two years, Iceland used threats, embargoes, protests, and all sorts of political nonsense, and in early 1961, with US support, Iceland was able to pass their bill, and was granted ownership of the 22 kilometers of water off their coasts. A momentous victory that really angered the British fishermen. But that decade was a little rough on the fishing industry for Iceland. British sailors still occupied the best fishing spots, which were up to 90 kilometers off Iceland's shores, and were catching all the cod in the area. So Icelandic President Christian Eldian came up with the idea in 1972 to extend the Icelandic sea borders from 22 kilometers to 370 kilometers, which was about 200 nautical miles. Even the Icelandic people didn't really like that idea, so 90 kilometers was seen as reasonable because that's where the best fishing spots were. The British prepared to battle Iceland in their waters again, but this time Iceland had a few decent quality ships, and they had American helicopters. They had made a new version of the ICGV Aegir, and another ship called the ICGV Odin, which was a good one. On the 1st of September 1972, they began enforcing the 90 kilometer law, chasing off or cutting the nets of pretty ships in the area. As you can guess, this angered the British again, who sent in another fleet. In January of 1973, 
a volcano erupted on an Icelandic island, which forced the Coast Guard and their three ships to evacuate the inhabitants rather than keep harassing British trawlers. They were back at it by April, though. In May, the British fleet arrived. Thirty frigates scoured the sea for the Icelandic ships and protected trawlers in the 90 km zone. British jets flew around as well. This really angered the Icelanders, who demanded something be done about this and wanted to call the US in to bomb the British. Nothing really came of that though. The Icelanders knew if they fired their cannons in a chase, they would be attacked. So they developed a new but age-old strategy for harming other ships, ramming them. Icelandic ships have a heavy reinforced bow to allow for ice breaking, and besides cutting their nets, Icelandic patrol ships frequently rammed British trawlers. On August 29th, Agir collided with another frigate, but below deck, engineer Haldor Halfjörsson was doing electrical repairs. The collision created a big hole in the hull of the Agir, which flooded his area. His electrical equipment touched the salt water and, well, he got fried to death. This was the only death in the whole Cod Wars, though. After a few more clashes, Joseph Lunds arrived in Iceland to talk terms. They came to the terms that Iceland could have its 90 kilometers of sea around itself, but had to allow British fishermen the ability to catch a certain number of fish per year in that area. Iceland agreed, and the Second Cod War was over. By the beginning of 1974, though, tensions were still high in what would set the stage for the Third Cod War. Multiple British trawlers, who were still in the Icelandic area, were towed back to Iceland and had their crews arrested. A big incident happened in July of 1974, when the CS Forrester trawler was shot at by the ICGV Thor before being towed back to shore with moderate damage. At the 1975 UN meeting, several countries expressed their desire for an international decree that every country could own 100 nautical miles, or 185 kilometers, of sea off their land. Iceland went back to the idea of having 200 nautical miles, or about 370 kilometers, of sea off of them. There really isn't a reason for this except that they wanted British fishermen off of their cod stores that would be exclusive to Icelandic fishing, and this would come into effect November of 1975. Nobody really took Iceland seriously though. On December 11th, ICGV Thor was chilling at the east side of Iceland when it got word two large British ships were in that area. Thor went to investigate and found two giant oil tankers. The oil tankers proceeded to tack from side to side and slam into the Thor and only retreated when the Thor began firing at them. Thor could barely float and somehow made it back to port with significant damage. It was crushed between the two trawlers and took a while to repair. The British blamed this incident on the Thor, and Admiral Edward Ashmore assembled a fleet to go to Iceland again. The British didn't actually really care about Iceland really this time. They just wanted to test their new frigates and show naval superiority. It was the final decisive showdown. Iceland was determined to hold its own and enforce the 370 km boundary. Britain was determined to make Iceland look bad and turn NATO members against them. In January, the Thor was on patrol again, when the HMS Andromeda pulled up alongside it. It sped past the Thor and then turned into its path, having Thor smash it and then blame the Thor for damaging it, and a fight almost broke out. Admiral Ashmore used tactics like this to make it look like the Icelandic ships were attacking and ramming his ships. But the Royal Navy had recent budget cuts, and getting their new frigates smashed wasn't really a thing that the High Admiralty wanted to do to save money. Through this, the Icelandic Coast Guard continued to cut the nets of trawlers in their fishing zone. On the 19th of February 1976, a fisherman received extreme head injuries after a metal bar knocked loose by cutting the net, smashed him in the head. Something Icelandic officials would personally apologize for. The British though, kept on ramming and trying to get rammed by Icelandic ships. To the point of it costing them millions of British pounds. Iceland actually was ramming British naval ships though. As depicted here in the famous picture of the ICGV Odin ramming the frigate. 
HMS Scylla. Iceland was just angry at Britain and would ram British Navy ships even if trawlers weren't around, just out of spite. Britain had 30 ships, Iceland had 6 smaller ones, but the Icelandic ships managed to consistently beat back the British ones, as Royal Navy captains feared damage. In March, HMS Yarmouth, a large frigate, somehow managed to get its entire bow ripped off by the small, simple armed whaler ICGV Baldur. Her bottom deck started flooding, and if it wasn't for the assistance of the Baldur and a British tug, she may have sunk. The HMS Diomede was rammed by the Baldur multiple times in multiple different days, the last of which gave her a giant 40-foot gash in her hull. In early May, the HMS Eastbourne was rammed straight in her side by multiple Icelandic ships, causing so much structural damage to the ship that it was no longer fit for service by the Navy and was permanently docked. At this point, Britain was spending extreme amounts of money on ship repairs, and other nations began to realize Britain may not be the victim there. When the Icelandic government threatened to shut down the NATO base in Iceland, which was used by the US to hunt for Russian subs in the North Atlantic, the US got really mad at Britain and demanded they make peace with Iceland. Britain gave in and allowed Iceland its 370 km sea zone in early May. The last action took place on the 6th of May, when ICGV Tyr, the second largest ship in the Icelandic Coast Guard, was trying to cut the nets of a trawler, but was rammed by the much larger HMS Falmouth twice, causing extreme damage to the point that if it was rammed again, it probably would have sunk. So the Tyr fired at the Falmouth, causing much damage to its bow. The Falmouth and the trawler then retreated from the Tyr, but it looked as though the war was over anyway. In June of 1976, all the British ships left, and most of the trawlers soon after. To this day, Iceland is still hunting and chasing illegal British fishermen in its waters, but this is where we have the negative side effects for the British. Not only were all three cod wars basically a humiliation for them, but hundreds of fishermen lost their jobs. But that was it. The cod wars 